My name is Gretchen Zucker. I work with an organization called Ashoka, which is a network of social entrepreneurs. Um, about 4,000 social entrepreneurs that are collectively working with other leaders in society to solve some of our society's most intractable problems. And I also work with two wonderful impact investment organizations. One is called Imperative and the other is Elevate. It is a privilege to be here with you today at SOCAP. We're so grateful. We look forward to working together during this session to do some problem solving. And what we believe that we will discover over the course of this conversation is that commercial real estate can be a powerful force for the fight or in the fight for equality when we approach it with two mindsets. One is that what we're really doing is we're investing in people. That's what investing in communities or investing in properties is all about. It's the people who are living there who we are working with to um, to improve the community and create and help the world be a better place. And two, we're taking a systems change approach to our investing. And we believe that we can do this and still achieve risk-adjusted market returns on our investments. So I'd like to introduce our other speakers, facilitators. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to do a elevator pitch for each of our facilitators. So I'll start with Camilo Galvez, who is the founder and CEO of the Imperative Fund. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so my accent is from Colombia. Uh, however, I ran a financial company based in New York City, probably because it's pertinent to the event in which we're in today regarding social capital. Um, I'm going to start giving you an idea of what, what we do by talking about the different socioeconomic systems that could exist um, in, the, um, in the world in general. However, I think that one thing that we would all have probably in common, or most of us will have in common, is that whatever system exists, you call it however you want to call it, social capital, capitalism, liberalism, uh, and all the alternatives, at the end of the day, most likely, all of us would like to have a system that promotes abundance as opposed to scarcity. And um, I believe that humanity, especially in the past 10,000 years, has done a very good job of generating abundance, although it has happened in pockets and the distribution is slightly skewed. So any effort that one can put into trying to level up this distribution of resources, I think it's fundamental in promoting the continued evolution of our species. But at a more practical level, so what we do is we have two business segments uh, in our financial company. One business se uh, segment specializes in investing in prosperous companies in the United States. And then our share of profits, we move it to the other business segment, which attempts to promote poverty elimination by <clears throat> generating credits within the marginal communities, people who are outside of the financial system, hoping that after a certain amount of time, we can actually bring them into the mainstream economic system. And besides that, we can uh, assist them in eliminating what we define as material poverty, while also generating some value creation in terms of a net worth for these families. And then whatever revenues we get in this segment, we move back to the other business segment when the opportunity comes along. And we try to basically redistribute this capital in a way that we hope our company is helping level up a little bit this skewed distribution that I just referred to. So again, thank you so much for being here. And then I assume that once we get into the case studies, there's going to be more details on to how we particularly um, operate our credit um, uh, business segment. Thank you, Camilo. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Joseph Spence, who's founded many things, one of which is We Are Makers. He's also a partner with Justice Capital former head of technology, media, commercial real estate for Europe, Middle East, Africa, and the Americas, which I think is pretty much everywhere except for Asia, at Goldman Sachs. And he's also a business partner to Imperative. Hello, everyone. How you doing today? Come on, a little bit more energy. How are we doing today? Is it a good session so far? <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll start there. Um, Listen, I mean, clearly everyone that's on this stage today and you've heard it from Camilo 
may not know, Camilo is, is, you know, sometimes doesn't, won't necessarily share all the wonderful and great things and impact that he does. So I'm not going to let him get off the hook. I'm going to do a little bit of that here. And you'll see in the case studies, of course, uh, that you look at. Um, but we're all here bounded by this idea that um, we can use real estate and, well, living, living arrangements for people to help build wealth and get people out of poverty relatively quickly and do it in a way that creates more freedom versus impoverishment. And so, you know, as, as Gretchen mentioned, there's a number of ventures of which uh, I have focused on and, and founded over the years, uh, post uh, my time uh, at Goldman. And, and, but those, the themes that I work on, which are purely impact related, all did start there. You know, the uh, tech media and telecom was a huge focus of mine. I was also uh, an engineer in the past life. I worked at NASA, as well as uh, real estate. And so understanding smart and sustainable cities has become an incredible passion of mine and all the things that go into it. And so when we think about affordable housing and the way in which we all live in communities, that's also a very important part. And how do we expand that and create more options for, for uh, the people who, whom we want to serve? So just very quickly on that, I've partnered with uh, Camilo in the work um, in all the housing developments that he is building out in emerging markets to begin to come on top of that and say, what else can we do with the residents that we are having here with whom we are building meaningful wealth for in terms of equity? And so we're looking at this and saying, listen, you know, this person maybe that had negative net worth now has 40 or 100 or so K in equity that's leverageable. What are the wonderful products we can build on top of that, not to sap them, but to multiply them, to take that amount of money and make that 40, 400, right, over time. And so we're coming together with the educational resources and the structure and setting up cooperative ventures between uh, the groups in order to help make that happen. So I'm, I'm not gonna go any further on that because I really wanna hear from you all today about what you think about some of the possibilities are uh, within that realm. So I'll stop there on this question. Is there anything else I should be saying? Is that good? That's perfect. Thank okay. you, Joseph. Pass the mic. <laughs> yeah, now we pass the mic to Dimitri. Dimitri is the founder and managing partner of Elevate Commercial. Gretchen, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Dimitri Booker. I'm the founder, managing partner of Elevate Commercial. We're a socially responsible, fully integrated commercial real estate firm um, based in sunny San Diego. Our focus is to manufacture housing. We, we look at manufacture housing and what we bring to the table to be um, using business as a force for good. Um, you guys may know manufacture housing as mobile home parks or trailer parks, um, but we look at these as communities. And so we want to change the stigma of how people look at these communities and improve our resident lives. The key word is we don't use the word tenant, we use residents. So number one, we're changing the mindfulness of our residents. Number two, we're changing their mindset, make sure they have a growth mindset. And number three, it's money mechanics. We're teaching our residents the money mechanics, so therefore, number one, they can buy their home. Number two, they can actually get together, form a community, and buy their communities and work with groups like the Rock Group, and that's our mission. Um, also, one of our key areas, the reason why we're here today, is we feel that there's areas that we can improve. Number one, there's a lot of great minds in those rooms that we can work with. Number two, there's impact investors, and our biggest challenges we have is, number one, changing the stigma of these communities and making sure that the whole industry as, as a whole changes. Uh, number two, we're looking at how to reduce um, the cost of capital for our residents. Uh, currently, they're paying 10% for their loans to buy these homes, and we all know that's a high interest rate, and we're looking at better opportunities to reduce the cost of capital and being the, the, change, the, the leader in the industry to help our residents have a cheaper cost of capital so they can improve their financial well-beings. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. And last but not least is my very dear friend and longtime collaborator, Rosario Londoño. I think it's on. Yeah, I'm on? Good. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to this session. My name is Rosario Londoño. Also, my accent comes from Colombia. I didn't know Camilo before we actually started working together. Um, some, one day somebody said, what you are is a systems preneur, so I took that on as an identity. I like to change systems. My background for many years in impact investment and innovation. 
One day I was at a conference in innovation and I learned that they're teaching bacteria how to count. And at the same time, in that same week, I learned that it takes around nine to 12 generations for the lower 10% of uh, people living in poverty to actually get out and be uh, just above, uh, right into the in middle income. So imagine nine to 12 generations for the US and OECD countries is 4.5. And I say, how can this be? There's enough money, the solutions are there. How do we connect the dots? And I really think that the connecting the dots is right here in this room. Um, what you're about to hear and has been taking time, maybe 10 years to get to where we are in different ways, but I do believe in the power of acceleration. And I think that the, this workshop is the beginning of, of our co-creation together. And we're hoping to, for you to really give your most and, and please uh, pitch in and help us uh, continue with these solutions because we want to be able to get people out of poverty in two years or less, not in any generation. So that's the ambition and I think it's been done. So thank you, Gretchen. And that's the title of our workshop. That's what we're working on. So we're gonna show how we're doing that. Um, but we're also gonna do some problem solving together. And so can we put the slides back on the screen? There we go. Um, so the goal of this session is to tap the brain power in this room to do some problem solving together. As social entrepreneurs, we face so many challenges and we would like to share a few of those with you in the form of these case studies that you will see on the tables. They're also in your app on your phone. Um, and we are going to problem solve together as teams and see what great ideas we come up with. Um, before we get started, we'd like to do a poll to actually see who's in the room. So we have the poll in the app, but it may be good just to do the old fashioned way, which is with a show of hands. So if you are an investor, raise your hand. Sorry, and I are investors also. OK, so we have some investors. Social entrepreneur. Awesome. Uh, commercial real estate company. Excellent. And none of the above, or some or none. All right. So a good, solid group that's totally coming from out of the box and um, providing their wisdom and ideas as well. Great. That was very simple. We didn't have to use the app. OK, so we're going to tee up the four cases. Um, and um, as I said, you'll see them on the table. Looks like this. But first, I'll spend some time running through them quickly. Um, each table has different cases. So feel free to start taking a look, and then also I'll give you some background. So case studies one and two are about imperative. Camilo's company that Joseph is working with, too. And Rosario and I work with, too. And the protagonist of this story is a woman named Linda. This was Linda's house before on the left, and this is Linda's house now on the right. So how did Linda move into that house. And she did through an amazing Ashoka fellow named Francesco Piazzetti, who has several innovations that I'll quickly talk us through. One is the brick, which they call the eco block. And how that brick is made is from the dirt that the houses are being built on. <laughs> and the bricks are cold compressed through that blue machine, another innovation. And that machine is operated by the people who are going to buy those houses. So it's a whole, it's a little habitat for humanity like, and that the community is building these houses collectively with the construction company that Francesco leads. So the other innovation is that how the community is designed, all the amenities in the community, like whether they're gonna have little yards where they can hang their laundry, if they're going to have a community space, and the design of the house itself is collectively decided by a community committee in which they make these decisions together. So they're already coming together as a community and collectively deciding how they're going to design this community. So this investment that Imperative makes in Italy a tu casa is one of several. So Imperative takes a syst systematic approach to investing and there are actually a whole bunch of other social entrepreneurs 
primarily from the Ashoka network, that are delivering all sorts of other products and services to these communities to help lift these communities out of material poverty. So water purification systems that are installed in their homes that are financed. Um, digital devices, internet access, and so on and so forth. And because it's a sy systemic approach that Imperative is taking to underwriting these companies, it means that Imperative is addressing eight SDGs all at once. So how the capital works is that there's a, there are three groups of investors that are investing through Imperative. One is the DFC, which used to be OPIC. That took you how many years? Five years? Five years. It's like eight Very months and 62 days, but who's counting, right? right. <laughs> plus private investors, plus family offices are all collectively investing and underwriting loans to a bank that has been set up by Francesco's Venture. That's a federally insured regulated bank in Mexico. And that bank is then underwriting mortgages to Linda. So the return to the investors is six to eight percent. That's what DFC basically agreed to. So this is all the investors are basically getting a return of six to eight percent, six to eight percent. The bank is charging an interest rate of 18 percent. That may seem high to us, and when we talk about chattel loans, it's going to seem really high, but by Mexican standards, that's actually cheap, but still. But the best ROI is for Linda and her family. And how Linda is getting an ROI of 32% is because the way that Imperative and HLA have set this up, once these homes are built, they have to be serviced by the state, which means paved roads, electric, um, water, sewer, et cetera. And so these homes, after a five-year mortgage, are getting appraised at about $40,000. What Linda paid all in with the down payment, interest, principal, fees, et cetera, is $8,000. So her $8,000 turns into $40,000, and that's her asset. She has already effectively joined the middle class in Mexico. So that's how the model works. Case study number one, though, is going to ask us a question. That 18%, by Mexican standards, it's reasonable. But by our standards, we think it's too high. And what goes into that 18% is, of course, the, our cost of capital, what we're charging. But it also um, includes other things, in particular, the cost of servicing the loan. So that $8,000 that Linda is paying in all of those payments over five years, 18% of that goes toward a brick and mortar office that's on site in the community that is servicing the loan. So there's a staff of people who are going around collecting mortgage payments from Linda and all of her neighbors. On the one hand, we really like that team because they are not only, they're part of the community. In fact, they probably live in that community in many cases. And the, they, they keep the delinquency rate really low and they keep the default rate at zero. That's been our, our, our experience to date. So on the one hand, they're doing a great job at collecting, but on the other hand, we'd love for Linda to be able to, if she saved 18%, she would save $1,400. So it's her 8,000 that she paid would be more like 6,600. And her ROI would be that much bigger. So that's the first case study is, what can we do to help Linda save money? And so Camilo is our guy who's going to be working with our tables that are doing case study number one. So the second case study is also about Linda. Linda now has a $40,000 asset. She also has a credit history. She also took financial literacy classes in order to qualify to get the mortgage in the first place and to be able to pay the down payment. So Linda is now suddenly an untapped market that's never been banked with before. What are the other financial products and services that could be offered to Linda that could be really valuable to her that she never would have had access to before? 
car loans, uh, home equity line of credit, business loans, insurance, and so forth. And what's Imperative's role in all of this? Should Imperative start rolling out other financial products? Should Imperative start partnering with other companies to do this? And how much should we feel responsibility that Linda's not taken an advantage of? So that's the second case study. Okay, case study number three is about Elevate and Dimitri. So Elevate, as Dimitri explained, buys and operates manufactured home communities, otherwise known as mobile home parks, across the US. So I don't know how many people know much about mobile home parks, but there are 44,000 mobile home parks in the US that are land lease mobile home parks, and 22 million Americans live in manufactured homes. Manufactured homes, by the way, that are made today are just as good, just as high quality as what you call a stick built or a site built home. They're built in a climate controlled factory on an assembly line. It's actually amazing <laughs> to see how they do this. And so these are quality homes, but as Dimitri said, there's a stigma attached to these um, mobile home parks. But we believe that manufactured homes are a key ingredient in affordable housing. So what does land lease mean? It means you own your house, but you rent the land that your house is sitting on. You pay lot rent. And so Elevate and Ashoka um, are doing a unique collaboration as far as I know. <laughs> I don't think anybody, I mean, I certainly know nobody else has done anything with Ashoka like this before. And this is, I still pinch myself that this is happening, that we're doing this together. So Elevate is working together with me and my colleagues at Ashoka to bring innovations from the, this network of social entrepreneurs, the Francescos of the world, to these communities to help these communities develop, essentially flex their muscles as change makers, essentially. And Elevate is contributing a share of the profits through a donation to Ashoka to seed new social entrepreneurs. And we're doing this as a pilot in three mobile home parks. And so even with that contribution, the charitable contribution that's going to Ashoka to fund new social entrepreneurs, Elevate is still producing a market return. I thought that was kind of cool comparing it to the S&P. That was through the past couple of years. The market has tanked. We're still doing great. <laughs> So, as Dimitri said, success in, in, for Elevate is when the residents get to the point where they would be able to buy and operate the manufactured home community, operate it themselves as a co-op. And so the ideas and offerings that we're bringing to these communities have to do with essentially creating an owner's mindset. And so the sense of being collectively invested in improving the community because over time, if they were to form a rock, for example, they would have to form the co-op, they'd have to elect a president, a treasurer, a secretary, they'd have to vote, they'd have to decide whether they would buy this multi-million dollar asset, and then they'd have to operate it. So really creating a sense of ownership, an owner's mindset is a key part of supporting the residents to the point that this is a viable exit for Elevate. And then also, it's um, uh, the, our kind of second main area, like Dimitri mentioned, is money matters. And it's about um, supporting the residents in um, developing financial readiness through wonderful partners that we've brought through the Ashoka Network that support the residents through um, emergency grant circles. We were the first to do that. We were the first to work with um, Isuzu to bring on-time credit reporting, or rent payments to improve their credit scores, and to provide emergency loans and to um, allow the residents to break their rent payments into smaller increments to smooth out the dips and spikes in their income through a wonderful partner called Circa. The residents are also doing saving circles, which is something that we would, are looking to see how we can further formalize and augment. So this is all going great. The problem for Elevate that we're grappling with is that mobile homes are not considered real property, they're considered chattel, which means movable property, and yes, that's still the term that they use in the industry. 
So you have to Google chattel loan and, t and you know, apply for a chattel loan. But chattel loans, because they're not considered real property, cost dramatically more, about twice the price of a regular mortgage. So our question that we'd like to brainstorm with the group about is how can we either securitize, collateralize, or otherwise help lenders see that this is as good of a loan that they could make as real property. And then finally, one more, and then we're done, and then we're all going to start working together. Hopefully you've seen with these residents forming a co-op and them taking initiative and voting to buy the park, with the residents forming a community committee to help design the communities with imperative and HLA to casa, you'll see that the thread running through this is this sense of empowering the communities to be change makers. So our fourth case study is about that. We're applying that concept to multifamily. So another partner that Rosario and I are working with is asking this question, which is about tenant councils. So tenant councils or resident councils um, are very common in public housing, but very, very uncommon in privately owned and operated properties. But if you do it right, you can have, it's, I think of it like a PTA, how the parents are working with the teacher and the principal to try to help the kids get a good, great education. <laughs> so for the parents are like, yes, we're involved. <laughs> And probably the principals are a little like, these parents are a nightmare, right? <laughs> so I think that's generally the conundrum for these landlords, is how do you work with an empowered resident base in your community, and can this become a win-win? So the protagonist of this case study is a wonderful man named Scott, who Rosario and I were working with. Scott is not here, so <laughs> Rosario and I are. And so we will be floating around now as we're working on these case studies. So these are the four case studies. The second thing that you see on this table is a hypothesis sheet or a test card. So the hope is that as you get together, and again, try to consolidate if you want to have a conversation with a colleague, or you can do it on your own. Um, and we would really, really value your ideas. We will be collecting these test cards, and we will be using them. So thank you so much for sharing your ideas with us. The case study should take no more than five minutes if you haven't already looked it over or if I haven't teed it up. Um, and we will be floating around to have the conversation with you as you're reading and discussing and starting to put together a hypothesis solution. Any questions? Maybe, oh sorry. Maybe also just to clarify, after we do the case studies, and then we'll have a Q&A to be able to go, if you have any more questions. Right. questions about the instructions. Yes, <laughs> now questions about the instructions. Okay, then we'll be answering questions about these wonderful social entrepreneurs and their models. So this is our opportunity to share some of our brilliant ideas. We will be collecting these hypothesis sheets, and we are really so grateful that you are sharing your wisdom with us. I heard some fabulous ideas, and I'm excited to hear more. Uh, but then we really do intend to go around and collect these. So if you could leave your hypothesis sheets, we would really appreciate it. Feel free to take the case studies with you if you'd like. Our contact information is in there. Would anyone like to share their ideas with the group, and or if you have questions that you'd like to ask of the group, we would be delighted to answer those as well. Anyone? Anyone? And if not, if we still are just feeling really inspired and want to continue to problem solve, that's also great. Yeah. So is it okay to share with the whole group? Okay. Cool. Well, so in ours, we were talking about this idea of, of lifting whole communities out of material poverty in two years and then what other financial services we could provide in order to make that happen. And I guess I was just wondering, what, like, what is the definition? Like, what is the delta between where somebody is at when they've gone from investing $8,000 to now they have a $40,000 asset to now being materially out of poverty two years later? Like, what is, 
what don't they ha have at the point when they have the $40,000 asset that they would then have two years later when they're materially out of po poverty? That's my question. Uh, good. Well, I think the asset, the, ha the home asset itself, is definitely part of their material wealth at this point. I'm yeah. curious, Camilo, did you hear that question? The definition of material poverty? So we, we, we see it in two dimensions. The first one is having access to what we call universal goods and services. And the second one has to be, it's, it's associated with being part of the economic system of your, um, the place that you, where, where you live in. So we came to the definition, number one, because we, when we started the project, initially we didn't agree with the most accepted definitions of poverty. For example, a minimum amount of income per month, per day. Um, because, of, because of, I mean, there is enough empirical data to see that sometimes this can fall short when you're actually trying to implement an intervention program to help eliminate poverty. Uh, it's been done uh, by the United Nations through the Earth Institute at Columbia University. By the way, I know that well because I work at Columbia as well. Um, so in order to be able to measure the impact that we were having in terms of poverty elimination, we came to the following definition. Rather than by asserting that this is poverty, by actually rejection of the hypothesis. So here it goes. If you grew up in a community where you had access to financial literacy, you had access to a proper urban development plan, you had access to structural housing, anti-seismic thermoadaptives, meaning that temperature is controlled throughout day and night. You had access to wire, water, sewage, electricity. You had access to a comprehensive healthcare system, and you had access to proper waste management. Why would you consider yourself materially poor? So it's, it's, it becomes kind of hard to make the case. And then besides that, if in the process of having access to these basic goods and services, you manage to, the people that we work with, our target population, do not have a proof of income and do not have a credit history. So if in the process of getting access now to these goods and services, you ended up creating a credit history, becoming part of the official banking system of the country, and you did it in a way that you generated returns by whatever investment is it that you were making, by getting this net worth that roughly right now averages at around $40,000, we believe that if not altogether or completely, some things might be missing, material poverty has pretty much addressed under this, under this uh, spectrum. Does that answer your question? So we have five minutes left. Um, who's willing to share their ideas with the group? But it's, it, or who has other questions that they'd like to ask of our entrepreneurs? You guys see me. Do it, do it. Hi, I'm Lisa Hansen. Um, Gosh, we had a tough one here with the the tenant uh, the tenant council discussion. It's just a complex issue to t tackle quickly. Anyway, we were discussing how to get the commercial real estate investors to adopt a positive view of tenant councils when they view design review as too much trouble. Um, and I think we came up with some really good thoughts on this. Uh, as far as working with the tenant councils in an empowering way, extracting kind of the, um, the goals of the community itself and allowing them to self-identify what the metrics for measurement would be, but then circling back to tie some of those metrics to research that would allow us to translate those results into investor language so that investors could see that the community-driven outcomes are going to result in a better performance of the investment. Uh, and we also had an angle on that where there's a de-risking element to the employment of tenant councils in that through the tenant councils self uh, naming their objectives and participating in the creation of those outcomes, we know that it wasn't an outside policy that was sort of detached from the community that we're putting our investment behind. We are 
able to de-risk by connecting directly to the community's outcomes driven by themselves. Does that kind of cover it? <laughs> that, that's a fantastic point. So from an investor standpoint, if you know that this has been a collectively agreed to set of capital improvements or what have you in that community, then you're going to... Uh, then you're going to feel better about your investment that it's going to pay off. Um, so that's so having it be investor driven could be a way to get that collaboration happening with the tenants in a community. It's a great point. So we would love for this conversation to continue, and so we were thinking that we might do this again. Yes, yeah, so definitely this is a starting point as we walked around the room. There's definitely a lot of people uh, that have some uh, direct experience. Other people are coming new. Um, but we think that there's, there's a need to accelerate CRE becoming an impact investment. Only there's, it's going to be a $280 trillion industry next year globally. And less than 5% actually does any impact measurement or initiatives. So we're hoping, if you're interested, to leave your name um, on the sign-up sheet, or you can do it on the app. We're hoping of hosting an event in New York, the Q1, where it would be much more hands-on, maybe a day and a half, of looking at specific um, things that we could move forward, and maybe with other commercial real estate investors in the room and people who also want to bring the systems change. So if you're interested in staying in the conversation, please, and um, we won't spam you with anything else. <laughs> we won't advertise any products or anything. It will only be um, to let you know where we're taking this. And hopefully we can, we can count on, on most of you, if you're feeling called, to stay in the conversation. All right. Okay, one last thing. Can you please become ambassadors to this? You all live in a house or someplace. Maybe you know of somebody who lives in a, an apartment building. Maybe you know an investor. Maybe it's about asking questions. Hey, what are you doing about this? What do you think about it? So we were, we're really hoping of, of having you as well go out and be an ambassador to um, this change. Thank you. I don't know if anybody else wants to say anything. Just thank you so much for your participation. Again, thank you all. And just let you know that we love sharing all our information. Um, if you, you, there should be any interest, we love to show the entire model. We love to show the numbers that we have obtained so far, explain what have been the biggest challenges, and also explain which institutions we've run into that have served as well. So in the event that we overlap in any of these interests, we love to put everything out of the table with transparency hoping that maybe it can also be useful to you. So in that respect, just make sure that if you're interested, you just let us know, and we would love to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for participating today, sharing your knowledge, your feedback, your wisdom, your resources. Uh, we're blessed to have you guys all here, so thank you for joining, and uh, looking forward to being in contact with all of you.